Before the birth of open source at the dawn of computing and the first concepts of computers, there was a man and a company who came closer than anyone else to embodying the values that our movements represent today. Whether we call them Linux, open source, or free software, the fundamental principle is one. Technology is human. Technology revolves around people. It's made for people, not the other way around. It's not just for consumers or passive users. It's a tool for social, community, and cultural growth. Well, this company was called Olivetti, and the man behind it was Adriano, Adriano Olivetti. Today, I want to tell you one of the most beautiful, undervalued, and forgotten stories in computing. While everyone talks about Steve Jobs, his first computer, his brilliant ideas, his concept of design, and his revolutionary stores, few remember that someone did all this much earlier. And I would say, in some aspects, significantly better. Let's start briefly from the origins to give context to what we're talking about. Olivetti was a family company born in Ivrea in Piedmont. Initially, it dealt mainly with typewriters, and in the post-war period, it became one of the world's leading companies in its field. But its founder was a visionary, and he understood very well that the real revolution was already moving elsewhere. This is why Olivetti represented for decades the absolute antithesis of the classic capitalist multinational. But careful, Olivetti wasn't a communist company. It was something much more complex and rarer. It was a visionary enterprise. And here we find a fundamental common point. What for years our movements, open source, free software, have been to Microsoft, Apple, or Adobe, Olivetti was to IBM, General Electric, and the entire Western economic establishment of the time. I'm not exaggerating with words. The concept of factory as community, as a space for growth and personal well-being. Employees pushed to educate themselves, schools, kindergartens, libraries, culture, and design brought to the center of the productive hub, a non-pyramidal organization that favored imagination, personal balance, well-being, industry as the living center of society, the factory as civil architecture a model and communicative example that would set a precedent and be adopted only decades later in Silicon Valley, but which here, in Italy, was already reality in the 50s and 60s. This is not utopia. This is what was. This was truly Olivetti. And it was precisely from this vision that the idea of moving towards electronics was born. Adriano Olivetti understood that to keep his company at the forefront, he had to enter the field of calculators. It was then that he met another genius, Mario Chu, a brilliant engineer, and together they gave life to Olivetti's electronics division. But who was Mario Chu really? Here's one of the most fascinating stories of this affair. Mario Chu was born in Rome in 1924, son of Yin Chu, a Chinese diplomat at the Holy See. Imagine a Sino-Italian boy growing up between two worlds, two cultures, in an Italy that still had to discover what internationalization really was. After graduating in electronic engineering from La Sapienza in Rome, Chu obtained a scholarship in the United States, first the Catholic University of America in Washington, then a master's in physics at the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn. And finally, listen to this, he became an associate professor of electrical engineering at Columbia University in New York. We're talking about one of the most brilliant minds of his generation a genius who was making a career in the heart of the American technological empire. And then came Adriano Olivetti. In August 1954 in New York, the two met, and Adriano, with his vision, managed to convince this Columbia professor to leave everything and return to Italy, to Ivrea, to build the future together. This isn't science fiction. This is true history. The objective was clear. Internationalization, progress, bringing Italy and Olivetti up to speed with the times and not only, surpassed them. In 1954, Adriano Olivetti established a small research group dedicated to electronics. And this group, led by Mario Chu in 1959, produced the Alea 9003. Perhaps this name doesn't mean much to someone today, but the Alea 9003 was a revolutionary product. It was one of the first transistor computers in the world, and for a long time it was among the most advanced in terms of technical capabilities. The memory had an access cycle of 10 microseconds with a speed of 100 kilohertz, excellent performance for the time. The computer had multitasking capabilities, able to handle three programs simultaneously, 
an extraordinary thing for those years. But here comes the first tidbit that few know. The name ELEA wasn't random. It was an acronym for Elaboratorio Electronico Arithmetico, which means arithmetical electronic computer. But Chu and his team chose this word also in honor of the ancient Greek colony of Elea in Campania, seat of the Eleatic school of philosophy. Parmenides, Zeno, the paradoxes of movement and infinity. These engineers were building a machine of the future and dedicating it to the philosophers of ancient Greece who reasoned about the foundations of reality and thought. It wasn't just a computer, it was a declaration of poetics. But the characteristics of this jewel didn't stop there. The Elea 9003 had a modular structure, and above all, a refined design. Yes, because it was designed by a great architect, Ettore Sotsas, and despite its dimensions, it appeared as something elegant, harmonious, even beautiful. Sotsas wasn't a technician. He was an artist, a design visionary. And when Adriano Olivetti asked him to design the appearance of this computer, he didn't think of an industrial machine. He thought of an object that had to live in human spaces. The cabinets were about one meter high and interconnected by overhead conduits, eliminating the need for the raised floor typical of mainframes of the era. The console had a mosaic display, colorful, almost hypnotic. It was a technological object that didn't seem like a threat or an alien machine. It had a human, aesthetic soul designed to live in people's spaces. And indeed, in 1959, this design won the Compasso d'Oro, the most prestigious award for Italian industrial design. A computer that won a design award. Let me repeat that. A computer from 1959 that won a design award. Not even the computers from 2001 A Space Odyssey, filmed almost a decade later and declaredly futuristic, could approach that level of formal refinement and conceptual innovation. The machine was revolutionary, and it wasn't American. Now, to truly understand how far ahead the Ilya 9003 was, we need to make a direct comparison with what was happening in the rest of the world. In the United States, IBM dominated with its vacuum tube mainframes, large, bulky, energy-hungry, requiring air-conditioned rooms and teams of technicians. IBM had announced some transistorized systems, but they were still hybrids, limited, designed more to replace punched card machines than to be true universal computers. The Elia 9003 was completely different, entirely transistorized, modular, expandable. Each cabinet contained a specific subsystem, processor, memory, tape units. You could configure it according to your needs. You could buy what you needed and expand it over time. It was the first open architecture computer in history, decades before this concept became standard. And while IBM was selling machines that looked like anonymous metal cabinets, Olivetti was selling functional works of art. The international reaction was immediate and stunning. At the 1959 BEMA in New York, when the Elia 9003 was presented to the American public, IBM technicians were literally left speechless. They didn't expect an Italian company, famous for typewriters, to produce something so advanced. Orders began arriving from all over the world, the first Elia 9003 was installed at Marzato in Valdano to manage the accounting and warehouse of what was one of Europe's largest textile companies. The second went to Monte dei Paschi di Siena to revolutionize the Italian banking system. But the most incredible thing is that the Americans themselves began to take interest. Olivetti was planning to open a factory in the United States to assemble the Elias directly there and serve the North American market. Imagine. An Italian company that was about to invade the American computer market with superior technology and a design that made all other machines look primitive. It was IBM's nightmare. And perhaps in hindsight, that was precisely the problem. But this dream was abruptly interrupted in 1960. In circumstances never fully clarified, Adriano Olivetti died suddenly on a train, officially from a brain hemorrhage. Just one year later in 1961, Mario Chu, the genius who had led the electronics division also lost his life in a mysterious car accident. Two suspicious deaths close together that left the company headless at its moment of maximum momentum. Coincidences of history, or perhaps stories we'll never know. The company's leadership passed to his son, Roberto Olivetti, who suddenly found himself under pressure. The banks, large industrial groups, the economic and political establishment, 
all were opposed to this heretical vision of enterprise. And so in 1964, the electronics division was sold. And guess what? Precisely to General Electric, a transition that marked the end of a silent industrial revolution. A revolution that had started from Evrea and had dared to challenge the world order of computing, led by the United States, and soon after, Japan. We could say the story ends here. And in a certain sense, it does. Olivetti, as a company carrying an alternative human, cultural, and social vision of the technology industry, it was stopped. But not everything was lost. Because from the ashes of the electronics division came other ideas, other products, other small miracles. A group of engineers, now orphaned of their leader, continued to work in secret on a new project. A much smaller machine, a desktop electronic calculator, programmable, as big as a shoebox. It was something completely different, no longer the mainframe, no longer the central corporate machine. It was something that brought computing into people's hands, a radical conceptual reversal. We're talking about the Programma 101. Presented to the public in 1965 at the BIMA in New York, the Programma 101 was for many, especially in Europe, but also for more attentive American historians, the first true ancestor of the personal computer. It used logical conditions, was programmable, and had internal storage memory. It even had a built-in printing system. All the ingredients were there. A human interface, relative portability, intuitive programmability, and all this was done, once again, by Olivetti, by a group of Italians who hadn't given up on the idea that only IBM or Silicon Valley could write the history of computing. And so, while an IBM mainframe cost over $100,000 of the time, the Programma 101 could be purchased for just $3,000, an accessible, revolutionary, unthinkable price for those times. But the real revolution was what it was capable of doing. At its presentation in New York in 1965, the Programma 101 shocked everyone. It worked with programmable magnetic cards, a concept that would become in the following years the absolute standard for the operation of personal computers. That day, to demonstrate the power of the machine, a program was loaded that calculated the trajectory of a satellite. In a few seconds, under the incredulous eyes of the American audience, the small Italian machine solved an aerospace physics problem. The audience was shocked, but perhaps more than anyone, Olivetti itself was shocked, which hadn't truly understood the scope of what its research group had managed to create. It wasn't just an electronic calculator. It was a new idea of computing. It was a huge success. In the United States, over 40,000 units were sold. And you just need to know this. NASA purchased 10 Programma 101s, and with those calculated the moon landing. Yes, you understood correctly. The moon landing was calculated with an Italian machine designed by a visionary group from Ivrea. Having said this, having said everything, the concept that went beyond the mainframe that seemed scary, inhuman, almost unconsciously an enemy, a distance to avoid, instead became familiar, personal, accessible, useful for everyday tasks, intelligent, brilliant, prescient, visionary, incredible. The vicissitudes of Olivetti's history continued, with ups and downs, until the 90s, when its presence in the computing world almost definitively faded. Certainly, Olivetti returned to dealing with computers, but under a different guise and with a soul that was now different, far from that original vision that had made it unique. And here we come to one of the most moving stories of this entire affair. Today, in 2024, there still exists a functioning LA 9003, only one in the entire world. It's located in a technical high school in Bibiena, a small town in the province of Arezzo in Tuscany. The Enrico Fermi Technical Institute. It's no coincidence, it's called that. This machine was donated in the 70s by Monte de Paschi de Siena when the bank decommissioned its computer system. And since then, generations of students and volunteers have taken care of this jewel. It contains more than 40 kilometers of copper cables wrapped in glass fiber. It's fragile, extremely delicate. If you stop running it regularly, it dies. If you move it, it dies. But it's still there still lit up, still functioning. When you turn it on, it lights up with its colored lights, emits its mechanical sounds, and for a moment it seems like being back in that Pisa laboratory in 1959, 
when Mario Chu and his guys were changing the world. It's a piece of living history, a museum that breathes, and occasionally pilgrimages arrive. Computing historians from all over the world who come to see the last survivor of that failed revolution. I find that the history and soul of this company are deeply significant and in many ways close to ours, to our community, to our idea of technology. At the dawn of computing and electronics, independent programmers, open source startups, or ethical hackers didn't exist yet. There were large companies, large corporations, and among these one, Olivetti, took a completely different trajectory, an intangible, revolutionary, almost poetic trajectory. Olivetti introduced new and radical concepts for the time, ethics, dynamism, sociality, beauty, color. Look at one of its typewriters, its pure art. Take that, iMac. Look at the images of the Olivetti store on Fifth Avenue in New York. It was considered by many one of the most beautiful commercial spaces in the world, an example of design, recognizability, and culture. And yes, because Adriano Olivetti had conceived the concept of Apple Store decades earlier, but they weren't aseptic environments all the same, with brown drawn wood and cold lines. They were places of art, imagination, beauty. And there were others in the world, like the one in Venice, equally extraordinary. The story of this company is fantastic, but also deeply unfortunate. One final curiosity, in 1978, Olivetti opened a research center in Silicon Valley when Steve Jobs was still closed in his garage. It was there, before the others, but it vanished, slowly, silently, and with it, the dreams of its creator also vanished. Today, when we use our computers, when we talk about design thinking, when we dream of more human technologies, we should remember that someone, long ago, in a small city in Piedmont, had already imagined all this, and had done it better than anyone else. Olivetti's revolution never completely died. It lives in every open source project that puts people at the center. It lives in every startup that chooses ethics before profit. It lives in every designer who thinks that technology should be beautiful as well as functional. It's a flame that continues to burn, silent but inextinguishable. And perhaps, one day, someone will manage to complete what Adriano Olivetti and Mario Chu had started, the dream of truly human technology.